Welcome to the show. We have a great show today. As you can see here, I'm cleaning out my backyard forge. If you haven't seen the video where we make this forge, I will post a link to it below. It really isn't that hard to get into forging. It doesn't cost a lot of money, and the basic skills are actually pretty straightforward. So today we're going to be making what might be considered the great granddad of all trench knives. This knife was known as the French nail. It was first developed probably in the very early stages of World War I, so a little over 100 years ago. It might be considered crude, but it was also very effective. And it was an answer to a problem that the common infantry were having as they faced the realities of World War I-style trench warfare. Namely, they were not issued a particularly effective hand-to-hand -hand combat weapon. If you don't know much about trench warfare, that's fine. Probably doesn't really affect this particular project. But there is definitely some fascinating history there, so I would recommend going even just to Wikipedia and looking up World War I trench warfare. So the French nail is essentially just a thin metal rod like a large tent stake or maybe a steel fence post that is flattened out and sharpened at one end and folded over into a crude but functional handle at the other end. Later versions of the weapon had a few added design features, probably a more ergonomic handle and maybe a better handguard. But we're going to be making the earliest version, which is actually surprisingly comfortable and useful. As you can see, I'm using rebar for this project. Rebar is a pretty good analog for the material that would have been used by the Allied forces in the early stages of World War I. It may be a little different in the composition of the steel, but in overall form it's quite similar, and I imagine the forging process is pretty similar to what would have been done 100 years ago in France. Now there really isn't a whole lot to say about this process. You can see what I'm doing here. I am not by any means an experienced blacksmith, and I pretty much learned by trial and error how to make one of these. But as you can see, all you really need is two bends and then a forged blade. Now to get the proportions of the handguard right, about all I can say is it's gonna take a little trial and error. The first time I attempted this technique, it was a little bit on the small side. It didn't fit my hand real well. So I just made sure to make it a little larger this time. But you do have to be careful not to make this handguard too large because a part of its functionality comes from that it fits the hand rather tightly. And that really means that you don't need a good thick grip built into the knife in order to get a good handle on this weapon and use it for what you might be using it for in combat. Now, an actual blacksmith with a better forge and more experience would probably be able to shape the handle end of this in a single heat. But I'm doing it a little bit at a time to give you the idea of how it's done, and also because I would totally screw it up if I tried to do this in one heat. When it comes to quenching the rebar, I've actually done experiments with this particular rebar before. I've quenched with both oil and water, but I've found that water gives the hardest quench. So that's what I'll be using for this project. Water is a little bit more violent a process than an oil quench, and so there is the possibility of some warping or cracking but I have intentionally left the steel pretty thick on this, so the odds of a crack are pretty limited. Once the quench was done, I examined the blade, and as I suspected, there was no warping or cracking, so it's time to temper the blade. As you can see, this will not fit in my super high-tech professional heat treating oven that I bought at Walmart for 25 bucks. So off camera, I brought this into the house and did the tempering inside. I tempered this at about 500 degrees. For an ordinary knife, I might shoot for more like 375, 400, 425, because that higher temperature will definitely soften the steel a little more, which will mean that edge retention will suffer at least a little bit. But in this case, a weapon that's designed for really, really rugged use in trench warfare, I would think that the toughness of the metal is probably more important than the edge retention. As I understand, in World War I, as with wars in general, there's a lot of downtime, there's a lot of boredom. And I would think that the soldiers would have had plenty of time, certainly at least once or twice a week, if not daily, to tend to the maintenance of their weapons. So having a blade that's tougher rather than a blade that maybe holds a better edge seemed like the logical way to go for me. One significant advantage is, of course, that it's much easier to put that final bevel and final edge on. If this was a very hard steel, I would spend a lot more time and probably waste a lot more material grinding an edge into it and sharpening it up.
Now, I would assume that these things were made without the benefit of any power tools. There weren't a whole lot of power tools in existence in 1914, 1915, and they certainly wouldn't have been commonly available near the front lines. But I will be using a grinder and a couple of other tools to really finish out the design. Realistically though, a good metal file and some patience would probably work just as well as an angle grinder like the one I'm using here. Now, full disclosure, I did not put a sharp edge along the back side of this knife. I would assume that in World War I they probably did sharpen up both edges, but for my purposes having a merely cosmetic edge on the back side probably makes more sense. For one, this is a replica knife, and there's about a 0% chance I'm ever going to use this knife in a combat situation. So having the backside sharpened really adds no functionality to it. And secondly, if there are any legal concerns regarding a, a knife that's sharpened on both sides, as there are in some states in the United States and certainly in other places in the world, this would eliminate those legal concerns. But with that said, I'm definitely putting a good edge on the front because in a minute here, I'm gonna be going up against a pumpkin with this thing. And I wanna give myself every advantage I can because it would be really humiliating to lose a fight with a pumpkin. Now I'm gonna make a prediction going into this. I suspect that this will not be a very good or very effective slashing weapon because the profile of the blade is actually pretty thick. The edge is a flat grind or maybe even a convex. And I think the knife will do much better at stabbing and maybe at chopping. So it definitely has some heft to it. But with that said, we'll test it out and see what the pumpkin tells us. Wow, I have to say, this knife definitely exceeded my expectations as a slashing weapon. Uh, definitely its strengths are stabbing and chopping with really deliberate, forceful blows. But as you can see, at least on a pumpkin and a cantaloupe, definitely a more effective slasher than I would have expected. And I imagine if you worked on that profile, flatten out the blade a little more, if you put a hollow grind along the edge, but even a decent flat grind and made a point to really sharpen it up, I think this really could be an effective slashing weapon. Well, thanks for watching today. I hope you enjoyed the show, and I also hope, for those of you who may be thinking about doing a forging project, but you think it might be too difficult or too expensive to get into it, I hope you can see how really easy it is to get into this. And of course, if you spend hundreds of dollars or a thousand or more up front, you can make things easier on yourself. You can get a much better anvil than the one you've seen me use here. You can get better hammers, you can get tongs, you can get you know a gas forge that's much easier to work with. But all of those things really just make the job easier. You can definitely start, in fact, you can start today with very basic tools and you can make some pretty cool stuff. So thanks again. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, I hope you'd consider doing so. And until next time, have a wonderful day, and we'll see you in the next video.